as I looked at the readings for today, it was kind of interesting to see the, uh, the different set, particularly the semi-continuous Old Testament reading that we've been following as we move through the generations from Abraham to Isaac and so on. Um, as an older brother reading the story of Joseph being sold into slavery, I have a little sympathy for the older brothers, right? I mean, sometimes the younger ones, they just don't mind their place. It's not being recorded, it's not a problem, but <laughs> sorry, Dan. Um, it's an interesting thing, this idea of this family dynamic and the tension that is there, and the idea of a younger sibling who, uh, you know, gets sold into slavery and falls upstairs, as we might say, and becomes the number two person of Egypt, or placed by God in a situation where when the family is in great need years down the road, would be in a place to help. And it's interesting, this profound story of pain caused by one to another that is returned in grace and forgiveness. That's not usually how it works. In this life, often it's you hit me, I hit you, right, is kind of the world that we live in. But God calls us to a different way of being, forgiving, forgiving, and showing grace. The gospel text for today, though, really is I mean, is there a better-known gospel story, right? I mean, even to this day, we hear stories or anecdotes or even memes about Jesus walking on the water or whatever the situation might be. And every time a reading comes up in the lectionary cycle, there are different phrases that come and jump out at me that in other times maybe don't stand out quite as much. This being my last Sunday before sabbatical, for some reason then the phrase where it says, Jesus went up the mountain by himself to pray, uh, feels like a more powerful phrase than it has in the past. Jesus is bombarded by people everywhere he goes. They are crowding in on him. And at the beginning of this passage, we hear Jesus basically say, this has been super fun but I need a little space for a minute, and he heads off, and he sends the disciples across the sea. Now, one might think that Jesus saw the storm and thought, that doesn't look like fun, I'm going to head out. Being a carpenter and not a fisherman, I'm thinking maybe he didn't read the weather quite the same way as the others did. But the other phrase, before we even get to Jesus returning, that feels powerful is this idea that their going was slow and tedious. This was a body of water that they were familiar with, had been on many times. The boat likely was familiar to them. They knew this place. They knew how to cross it. They knew what the weather meant. They had been doing this since they were children with their fathers on the lake. They knew this and the going was slow. Did you notice what the phrase is? Because the wind was against them. Because the wind was against them. Wow, what a phrase. Have you had times in your life where it feels like the wind is against you? And you're making progress, but man, is it tedious and this is not going the way I thought it would go because the wind is against you. There's something that is just kind of deep about that phrase because I think that is a powerful part of human experience. Rob Bell, an evangelical theologian, has made a series of videos that you might think of as parables, and he has one that's entitled Rain, and he's on a hike with his infant son in his backpack, and he gets halfway around the lake, and it starts to rain. And he says, it was raining hard. It rains a lot in this life, doesn't it? A lot. And that's, I think, an important metaphor as well. Now, the story pivots at this point. 
There's any number of things that could have happened, right? Jesus could have just stayed up on the mountain and said, hey, I'll meet him next Tuesday. Um, that could have been the story. It wouldn't have been as exciting, but that could have been the story. Jesus could have gone to the other side and just watched and, and waited, right? But he doesn't. There's a sense of concern, almost, that the wind is against them, that the storm is preventing them from coming to him. Isn't that the way of storms? The wind and the rain of this life, it's as though our visibility gets reduced, right? My car that I'm about ready to climb into and drive across the United States to collect a trailer because it's the kind of thing that Pastor Matt does to start a sabbatical. Um, my car has these cameras that tell me all kinds of things, including how close I am to the car in front of me, right? So that it might put on brakes or whatever. But um, if it rains really hard, it can't see. And I get this little image that comes up on my dashboard that says eyesight, and it has a big slash through it. And you can feel that the cruise control disables because the car cannot see. All of a sudden, you become entirely consumed with the things that are very close to you, right? The worse the weather is, the heavier the storm. Suddenly, the idea about Jesus or any sense of what's happening tomorrow is completely out the window because it's all about right here and right now. We can imagine the disciples may have entirely forgotten where they were going or who they were meeting as they dealt with the storm on the sea and their boat. How is that not like life, right? Things pop up and suddenly everything gets near and close and anything distant is lost. There is a sense in this story, though, that Jesus knows what they need to be near to him and so he solves this. He walks out on the water toward them. And have you ever noticed when things are stormy in your life, any variable that comes in kind of threatens your grip on things. Even if it's something that seems good at first, you might be like, oh, but I can't let go. I'm holding on for dear life right this moment. And Jesus' arrival walking on the water was not immediately seen as a good thing. It's a ghost. It's a ghost. One of the things that I think is key to this story and the piece that I want to leave you with, the interaction, the interaction between Jesus and Peter. So we all know how it goes. Jesus is like, hey guys, don't worry, it's me. And Peter says, I want to be with Jesus. Peter is like, I have had it being in this storm. I have had it fighting my way to make forward progress. I need to be with Jesus. Lord, command me to come out onto the water with you. And Jesus the, issues the one word command, come, come. Now what's interesting is what comes next, of course. Peter climbs out of the boat, starts walking on the water, and it doesn't go well, right? He begins to sink immediately. And Jesus reaches out to him and pulls him up. So we think, well, Peter can't walk on the water. His faith was less than it needed to be. But the piece that I want to leave with you is that we might think, well, maybe my faith isn't enough. Maybe my faith isn't strong enough. Do I have the faith necessary to meet Jesus, to walk through the storms of this life, to make it? The piece I want to leave with you is, it's not about your faith. It is about Jesus' faith in you. Jesus believed that Peter could meet him on the water and said, come. The doubt in Peter's heart was about Christ, not his own faith. So as we move through the storms of this life, 
be mindful that Christ calls you to come when things are the darkest and most stormy. And in that command, Jesus conveys confidence in faith in your ability to do just that, to come to him. Amen.